Acts chapter 1 this morning. Last week we began this lengthy journey through the book of Acts and looked at the first part of it, gave you some background. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But continuing on in the next section of Scripture here today, we're going to look at a section that is going to, in a very um, not detailed way, talk about prophecy and talk about the kingdom of Jesus and when He is going to rule and reign. When you look at prophecy and you think about it, uh, lots of people have different views on it. I don't know of anything in the church that probably brings about different views or more varied views than that of prophecy. Uh, there is a national denomination. It's not an evangelical denomination. It's actually one that um, I don't even know if they would have the gospel present. They're very legalistic in their orientation. But one of the things that they do is they draw people in through prophecy talks. And they'll, they'll send these mailers out to everyone. I was like, do you want to know what's going to happen? I, uh, a friend of mine on Twitter the other day put a picture of this, and it had Kim Jong-un on it, and it had Joe Biden on it. It had all these different pictures of these dif- different people, and he was like, it's funny. I got the same one last year with different leaders on it with the same words on the inside. It's like, hey, come and find out what's going on in the world right now as far as prophecy is concerned. You've had people like Harold Camping. Anybody remember him? He was a radio guy, I think, around t- 2010 who had predicted that Jesus was going to come back. And so you've got people who are setting dates like that. Uh, The Scripture, we're going to see this. There's a lot of prophecy in Scripture. Is this something that we should be concerned about? Should we be digging deep and drawing charts and trying to work all that out? Or is it not important? Is prophecy something that we should ultimately ignore? Well, Jesus is going to talk about this here and give us a little bit of an idea of how we should approach that. But he's going to go much bigger than that. The question that the disciples ask here is the one that's going to have him address what's going to happen. But he's going to go big picture here. And he's actually going to get to the root of answering this question that we have here on the screen. Why? Why does the church exist? What is the purpose of the church? And Jesus is going to address that here today. So look, if you will, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, or the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven." If you want a big thought to take home this week, it would be this. It's a continuation of our thought last week. And it's this. We continue what Jesus started. That's what we saw last week. And we do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you would, as I look at the Word here today, would you pray and ask the Lord to speak to you? I'm going to ask Him to speak through me this morning. Lord, I pray now that you would fill me with the Spirit. Jesus, you sent the Spirit for moments such as this. It is my aim and it is my goal to proclaim Christ here. Holy Spirit, it was promised in John 16 that you wouldn't speak of yourself, but that you would speak of Christ, that you would glorify Him. So I pray that you would do that. Lord, I yield to you. You know what a frail and corrupt vessel I am. So I pray that you would cleanse me of any unrighteousness that I've not already confessed. And Lord, that you would fill me up and use me for the glory of Jesus. And for my brothers and sisters and friends, that they would be persuaded by the Spirit and by the Word, not by my Word, so that their faith wouldn't be or stand in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Protect me, Lord, from my flesh. Put a guard over my mouth. 
But Lord, the things that are true, would you drive them deep into our hearts and change us by those words and by those truths into the image of Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Acts provides the background for the early church. It's the story of the early church and the background of the epistles. When you read the writings of Paul and John and the other apostles in the epistles, you begin to understand what's going on there, have a fuller picture of what's going on there when you read the book of Acts. We would be piecing things together and not have the full picture if we didn't have the book of Acts. When you look at the book of Acts, you see the start of the church. You see the growing pains that are happening there early on. We'll see how the church started among religious Jews and then spread to the rest of the world. It explains how you are sitting here today receiving the truth about Jesus, a Jewish carpenter, and to put your faith and trust in Him if you are a believer. Last week we looked at the background of this book. It's a history, it's a sequel, if you will, of the book of Luke. The author, we believe, was Luke, and he was writing to someone who might have been a prominent Roman. He was writing to him to more fully set out and convince him of the truths of who Jesus is. And if you remember, he said there at the start of it that the Gospel of Luke, the first volume, the story number one, if you will, account number one, it was all that Jesus began to do and teach. Jesus died, he was buried, he ascended into heaven, and this now is a continuation Luke is telling us of how Jesus continued to work and teach. We saw that the book of Acts ends a little bit awkwardly. You get to chapter 28, and there's no obvious ending to it. And it's almost like with that, that ending that doesn't have the death of Paul, it's almost like God is saying, hey, the church doesn't end here. You continue on, as we said. Acts 29 is where we're at now. It's a continuation of the work of Paul and the work of Jesus. So what he did in the first few verses was a little bit of a rewind. He talked about how Jesus, he came back to life, and he came back to life. He showed himself to these uh, disciples with these very strong, incontrovertible proofs. Luke has re done a rewind a little bit, and he set the foundation for something new. Now, we know about the ascension. We read about the ascension in the end of Luke. But Jesus or is going to say something here, or Luke is going to record something that Jesus says that we don't have in the Gospels, and it is so important and so vital to the mission of the church. I don't know if there is a more important passage in this book because it explains so much. And this is really one of the key passages of the New Testament because as Jesus ascends, this is the blueprint, if you will, of how His work is going to continue in this World. So as Jesus ascends, the disciples are told to do three things in this passage. The first thing that Jesus tells them to do is to stay focused. Now, in verses 6 through 7, they've come to him and they're saying, Jesus, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? All right, we've got to ask the question. That word restore is important. What does he mean, restore? That means that it's been taken or it's not what it was. Well, is that true? Well, absolutely. For 400 plus years, Israel had been ruled by other countries. You had the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the uh, Greeks even had some influence there. And then Rome comes with its iron fist and its iron boot. And here Israel is underneath the foot of Rome. They're underneath the Roman emperor. They have Jesus standing in front of them. Jesus, who has just been crucified, and, and he's risen from the dead. He's in this glorified body, and they're thinking... <laughs> this is it. We have a risen Savior. There's nothing that can stop Him now. I mean, our Savior came back from the dead. Jesus, you know that kingdom that you've been talking about the entire time that we were with you? You told us to seek first the kingdom. And you said that your kingdom would be uh, like this mustard seed that would go very, very large and that people would sell everything they could to be part of it and you urged us to be part of that kingdom and you told us to seek that kingdom first. That kingdom that you've been talking about, Lord, is this the time? Do you blame the disciples for asking that question there? I don't. It seems like it would be, it seems like it would be the logical thing. This is the perfect time to claim his kingship and to throw off the iron boot, the iron fist of Rome. 
As a matter of fact, this is a natural question for them. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, they would have known the Old Testament. The Old Testament talked about the fact that a Messiah would come and that He would be a king and that He would rule over His people. And they're thinking, Old Testament, this is where Jesus does that. They're also thinking about what Jesus told them. In my kingdom, you're going to sit on the 12 thrones of Israel and you're going to rule alongside me. And so Jesus has been raised from the dead and they're thinking... Here it is. This is the time. Jesus, is this when you restore the kingdom? They're essentially saying, let's go. We're ready. What was Jesus' response to this? Well, he tells them, tells them not to obsess over dates. It's this word that's used here, the word time. Look at how he says it. When they had come together, verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. Jesus is saying here that they shouldn't obsess over the timing of things. Now, we've talked about this before as we've looked at different passages. We've talked about the different date setters that were out there throughout history. The 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. Um, I remember, these just don't seem to be as prominent as they used to, but I remember the prophecy conferences, and we'd go to those, and the books, Late Great Planet Earth, and then, of course, you had the Left Behind series that was fantastically popular for a lot of people. I remember, and I just haven't seen these a lot, but I remember the very in-depth and detailed charts dealing with prophecy and how things were going to work out. I remember as a young man at 11 o'clock on Saturday night, probably it was Friday night, 11 o'clock on Friday night, watching Jack Van Impey take the news of the week. Anybody know who Jack Van Impey has ever heard that name? Uh, watching Jack Van Impey, he was uh, an evangelist who was heavy into prophecy. He would take the news of the week and apply it to prophecy. And I remember him stating with certainty when the European Union came about in 1991 that this is it. This is the 10 horned beast because there are ten nations in it, and then five more changed, and he was like, well, you know, at some point we're going to get back down to ten, and now it's twenty-five, and Jack Van Impey ain't talking about the European Union being the ten-horned beast anymore. I, I remember seeing all of those things, and the question that comes up with this is, what should our attitude be about prophecy? Is it important? I mean, Jesus is talking about His kingdom here. They're asking about the kingdom. When Jesus is going to rule and rain. I'm going to be honest with you, it's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit tricky because 25% of the Bible is prophecy. Now, that 25%, some of it was prophecy that would have happened in the lifetime of the prophet. Some of it related to the first coming of Jesus. Some of it relates to the second coming of Jesus. So with it being 25% of the Bible, we can't exactly ignore that. We shouldn't ignore that, but we need to take it for what it is. It's 100% accurate, 100% true. But we have to be willing to admit that it is, some of it, a little bit cryptic. And that there are some things that we can be clear about without any doubt, but then there are some things that we're like, you know, my lean on that is. My best guess on that is this. The thing that we don't want to happen is we think about the kingdom and Jesus coming and working all that out is it's easy with that to give in to fear. That's what I've seen a lot of prophecy do. I think that's what a lot of the Left Behind books did and other things. There was a subtle fear that drove it instead of understanding that Jesus is the center of prophecy and if you're rightly related to Him, there is no fear that can be in that. So how do we view it? Let me give you three different ways. When you think about prophecy in a New Testament context, and Jesus addressing this here, it almost is as if Jesus is saying, don't even worry about it. Don't even think about prophecy. And yes, He is saying that, but then we have the entire book of Revelation at the end. Does that mean that we ignore it? Well, here are three things. First of all, when you think about prophecy, Jesus talking about timing here and the seasons and when He's going to return... Keep the big picture. Keep the big picture. And the big picture is this. Jesus was promised. 
Jesus came, Jesus left, Jesus is coming back. The second coming is non-negotiable. The second coming is something that every believer should believe. It all revolves around Jesus. If we get caught up in the details and miss Jesus, we're off. We've gotten out of balance. Scripture says that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, is the fulfillment of prophecy. And if whenever we study prophecy, it doesn't bring us to the feet of the risen Savior, the ascended Savior, the returning Savior, then we have gotten off track. So number one, keep the big picture. Number two, as you think about the times and seasons and when Jesus might come back, see the power and sovereignty of God. He is above time, and He is working in a thousand ways to fulfill His promises. Understand that prophecy, whether we understand it or not, that God is going to bring about the result that He has intended and that He is powerful enough to do that, and we ought to rest in confidence in that. Number three, hold your view humbly. Uh, I am a convinced premillennialist. believe that Jesus is going to return and set up a literal thousand-year kingdom. I'm fairly confident in that. That's the position that our church takes. But you know what? I could be wrong or I could be off in the details. And it's not a cardinal doctrine of the faith. In other words, what you believe about the times and seasons isn't necessary for your salvation. As a matter of fact, in our statement of faith, we don't even put that underneath our cardinal doctrines. This is something that we could differ on in our church. You could have a different view of this, and it would be all right. Now, understand that uh, the perspective that we're going to come from in our preaching and teaching is going to be a premillennial view that Jesus is going to have a literal kingdom at some point. But you don't have to believe that to be a member here because you know what? Uh, we have to remember that there were men like Augustine and Luther and Edwards and Whitfield and Spurgeon and many godly people today who see it differently. I like to tell people I'm premillennialist, but I'm not mad about it. It's okay to differ on it. I won't break fellowship over it. Why? What is it, though, that you and me and those men from the past, what is it, and those women from the past, what is it that we all have in common? We all have in common the belief of what these angels say here at the end of this, that Jesus ascended into heaven and he's coming back the same way bodily to this earth someday, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So whether you believe in a rapture or don't believe in a rapture, okay, do you believe Jesus is coming back? And that he's coming back to rule, that he's coming back to judge the evil and the wicked and to bring about the eternal life that he has promise to those who have put their faith in him. The main thing is, is prophecy takes up a lot of your bandwidth. You're probably losing focus on something that we can't ultimately know. And so read through it, read through the book of Revelation, draw your charts out, that's fine. But um, don't spend days doing that and forget the mission that we have been given. Jesus says, don't obsess over dates. And he essentially says, don't build earthly kingdoms. And you say, well, he doesn't say anything about building an earthly kingdom here. Notice what Jesus doesn't do. When the disciples say, Lord, is this the time for the kingdom? Jesus doesn't say that there isn't going to be a kingdom. He doesn't tell them that they're wrong. He's just saying, don't worry about it. Don't obsess over that. Don't fret the timing of it. The important thing is, is that Jesus is about to give them a mission. And that mission... Church ain't earthly kingdom building. That's not what it is. That's not his goal in this in any way. He said that his kingdom wasn't then. There's nothing in the New Testament that tells us to build political bases and political parties and political kingdoms and power kingdoms here. That shouldn't be the goal of the believer in any way. Be good citizens. Absolutely. Yes. Beyond any doubt. You know, it, this is a good time to say this because it's 2021. I had to make sure I got my years right. It's been so goofed up the past few. 2021. We're not in an election year this year. So let's just go ahead 
and say it. Next year, there are going to be people who are going to be saying, and there's going to be a temptation to proclaim, we need to reclaim America. If the mission of Jesus isn't the main goal, we're off, we're off base. Your mission is not to reclaim America. Your mission is to make disciples. And as somebody who is an avowed political nut, I am concerned that building the kingdom of America takes up more bandwidth in the hearts of most Christians than it does the making of disciples and actually bringing people to Christ and loving them to Jesus. And it is one of the greatest travesties of this modern age that we somehow or another think that we're going to bring about the kingdom of God through political means. If that was the case, Jesus would have done it. If that was the case, Paul would have done it. And Paul didn't do it, and Jesus didn't do it. Now, we have a responsibility to be salt and light. We have a responsibility to live the morality of Christ and the gospel out. We have the responsibility to speak truth to power and to say that things are wrong when they are wrong. That doesn't mean that we withdraw from the public square. It doesn't mean that we don't advocate for policies that would, would bring about righteousness. That's not what that means at all. It just means that that isn't our main goal and that we understand that if we bring somebody to a policy of righteousness or a righteous stance but haven't converted them, or made them a disciple of Jesus Christ, we've made them twice the child of hell. We've brought them to a good stand, but not a relationship. And we've done no good. Let's keep things in perspective. Earthly kingdom building cannot supplant the mission. So even now as a church, we have to ask, are we building ultimately what is Jesus' kingdom? This brings about an important question. All right, Jesus says that the timing of the kingdom isn't then. The kingdom is future. You, or at least I believe, and most of you would probably believe that there is going to be a literal kingdom, and it is future. So when we talk about building Jesus' kingdom now, what are we talking about? There are some people who would look at this and say, we cannot speak of anything that we do as kingdom building now. Can't do it. The kingdom is totally future. This is the church. Forget the kingdom. The kingdom is going to be when Jesus comes, and we don't do that now. Then that means I've got to throw Matthew 6.33 out of the Bible to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. But we're not trying to establish the rule of Jesus on the earth, so what is it? Well, I've come to a belief that the kingdom of Jesus is something that you would describe this way. It's already not yet. It's already that Jesus is enthroned next to the Father, as we'll see here with the ascension. He is already ruling and reigning. And our goal is, is to bring as many people under the reign of Jesus in their hearts to where He is ruling and reigning there. Already, yes, ruling that way, but not yet the day that He comes and He has a literal kingdom. Jesus will take care of ruling the world someday himself at his return. That shouldn't be our goal. Our goal should be salt and light, not theocracies. So Jesus tells him here, stay focused. The next thing he tells him, or the next thing he tells him is to stay on mission. Verse 8, you will receive power, he says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The disciples were worried about now. Jesus had bigger plans than the tiny nation of Israel. His mission would cross geographical lines. It would cross cultural lines. It would cross cultural boundaries. And they're sitting here and worried about the tiny nation of, is, uh, of Israel. Jesus, when are you going to rule this nation? And Jesus is saying, y'all are, y'all are selling this thing short. I'm reading between the lines here. I want you to go to the end of the earth, to all nations. Now, for this to happen, Jesus tells them several things. First of all, it would require empowered witnesses. You will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come. Remember, I told you this was passive. It is God bringing it about. But this power speaks of a power that only comes from God. It isn't any human power in any way. 
Last week we saw that we are baptized with the Spirit. We are put in the realm of the Spirit. We are put in the Spirit so that Jesus can work by the Spirit. Remember, Jesus worked by the Spirit. Even the even what He said, the infallible proofs that He gave, He did those by the Spirit. There are lots of things that Jesus by the Spirit did by the Spirit, so we should as well. So before He leaves, He's saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Power for what? Now, we know about all the other work of the Holy Spirit. We know that He seals. We know that He calls. We know that He regenerates. We know that He comes along inside and He comforts. Yes, all of those things are functions and roles of the Spirit. But understand, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, the, the power, the aspect of the Spirit that He chose to highlight was this. You are going to have power from the Holy Spirit to do the main thing. And that is to be a witness. To be a witness of me. To tell about me. When they were faced with death, these witnesses wouldn't buckle. In the face of skepticism, they would give truth, and that truth would convince people even against what seemed to be the prevailing wisdom of the world. These witnesses would tell about a brutally murdered innocent man who rose from the dead so that he, for, he could forgive all of their brokenness. They tell about the fact that he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And guess what? As fantastic as that seems, people would believe it. And why would they believe it? Not because you or me or any person in history has had some great argument that convinced someone intellectually, it was because the power of the Holy Spirit came in and gripped their hearts and gripped their minds and convinced them that it was true. It was as Jesus said in John 16 when He has come, speaking of the Spirit, He will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He is the one who does that particular work. You know why people believe it? Number one, it's true. Number two, because the Savior would help them. The effect of this Spirit coming, or the Holy Spirit coming, would be the restoration of what Adam had wrecked. You know, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Creation has been marred by sin, and all of creation is groaning right now, waiting for the day of redemption. Jesus came to bring creation back to where it's supposed to be, and part of that is is to bring you back to where you're supposed to be. In Adam, he sinned. In Adam, he passed sin down to you. You've sinned. I've sinned. And because of that, we're broken. We're the enemies of God. And the image of God that we're told about in Genesis chapter 1 has been marred. And in a very real sense, the gospel, the purpose of it is to come back and to reconcile us to Christ. And then for Jesus to send us out into the earth, us being made in the image of Christ now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what your goal is and my goal is and our goal as a church should be? To fill the church with image bearers of Christ. People who have acknowledged Him as Lord people who are now made in His image and reflect that image. This is our mission. Jesus says that you need powered or empowered witnesses. He says that they needed to be all-in witnesses. Now, this word witness is interesting. I want to tell you, I don't like to throw Greek words around. I want to give you one here. The Greek word for witness is martus. What does that sound like? It's our word for martyr. That's what a martyr is. It is a witness. A martyr is someone who is a witness who is faithful to death. These are serious witnesses that Jesus is talking about. He's not sending them to a life of ease. The fact that he's telling these 12, or probably more than that here at the Ascension, this group of Jewish people that they are supposed to take the gospel to the end of the earth means that he's not talking about just going home and kicking up and telling a few people in your area about them. He's talking about, in some instances, picking up roots and going to places that they haven't been before and that no one like them has ever been, taking the news of Jesus and the witness of Jesus to those places. And that's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. 
going to be hard. Essentially, when Jesus says, I need you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, He is moving them out of comfort into a position of total trust in Him. And in many cases, even loss of their life to be a witness for who He is. Then He says that these witnesses, or this would require strategic witnesses. Notice how Jesus says this here, verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, or the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses. Then Jesus puts it this way. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Remember I told you the book of Acts actually breaks down this way. Chapters 1 through 7 focuses on Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 11, 8 through 12 focus on Judea and Samaria, what's going on there. Then chapter 13 to the end of the book is the gospel being taken to the ends of of the earth, to the end of the world. And and so Jesus is telling us here that things should start in Jerusalem and ripple out. Have you ever seen a really calm pond? And you go to that calm pond and you get a rock and you throw it in the middle of it, and what happens? There's a splash, and that splash ripples out. That's essentially what Jesus is saying here. There's a splash, that's been, a big splash, that's been made here in Jerusalem. And this needs to ripple out all the way to the ends of the earth. See, there was a promise from all the way back that needed to be filled or fulfilled. In Genesis 12, God had told Abraham, Abraham, there is a seed that you're going to have. In this seed, all the nations, all the people of the earth are going to be blessed. And Jesus right here is fulfilling a promise to Abraham. Take this gospel to the nations. Let them be blessed with the knowledge of God and how they can be reconciled to Him, how they can be saved. You know, there are some people, I don't know if I ought to say this or not, it just bugs me a little bit. It bugs me a little There are people who try and limit these things to just the apostles. They're so focused on the kingdom that they'll look like, upon this rock I will build my church. Okay? That was given to Peter. That's not for us. And these other promises, that are, that's just for the apostles. That's not for us. Well, you know what? I beg to differ. The book of Acts is full of the apostles going to the end of the earth, but also a bunch of no-names, people that we don't even know who they are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. If it was just meant to be the apostles, God sure took it a lot further than that and has gone a lot further through that through people who we've ever, never even known for two millennia now. No, as a matter of fact, this mission is the mission of the church. I would encourage you to possibly write this down and think about this. Every church should be an epicenter of missions rippling outward. Think about what would happen in the world if every church was a splash in the pond where it was and the gospel rippled out from that. Think of how the gospel would go. But what happens, and this is, this is, we saw this as we went through the churches in Revelation, what happens is churches tend to just focus on themselves. And they never even make a ripple in their community, much less to the ends of the earth. Because you get focused on maintaining and focused on what it is that they are doing. God wants this for our church. He is empowering us to be the epicenter of missions and epicenter of missions rippling outward to the ends of the earth. We should do everything in our power to be in a position to fulfill this in our community. When we pray that God would bring more people in here, when we pray that God would bring more disciples in here, y'all, we're not just doing this because we want to have a bigger church for numbers' sake. We want to do this so that we have a bigger pace of a bigger base of people that we can then disciple and send out in our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's not about numbers. It's about the mission. We should never, ever, ever, ever be content. 
with whatever impact we're having because there's more gospel work to do in our community. There's more gospel work to do in our nation, and there's more gospel work to do around the world. We try to fulfill this here. Y'all, you know that we're praying about how we can impact Greenwood. That's what we want to do. We're trying to do the Judea and Samaria, if you will. We've been to Boston for several years. That's kind of our nation, our Judea, Samaria. I'm going to talk with some church planters this week that are in Utah. It's possible that we might go out and help a church plant in Utah in some sense. We send missionaries to the ends of the earth. We can't just be focused on our community. We can't just be focused on the ends of the earth. We've got to be all of the above. And that is a strategy that Jesus gives his, his church. We can't lose sight of the untold millions who are untold. Next week, we're going to start something new in our, in our gathering, and Tanner is going to come every week and give us a people group who are unreached, 0% Christian. They don't have the gospel. He's going to give us their name. We're going to pray for them and pray that God would raise up obedient Christians to go and take the gospel to them. We have the power of life and we can't hide that. The final thing that Jesus tells us here is to keep looking up. Keep looking up. Look at verses 9 through 11. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into the heavens. After giving this last charge, Jesus is lifted up. Imagine this being carried into the clouds. How astonishing that would have been then. That would be crazy astonishing today. There are angels there to explain this. This, is, this creates quite the impression on the apostles and on the people who were there. Don't miss this. Jesus came miraculously. Jesus exits miraculously. He doesn't go out with a whimper. Angels were there announcing His birth when He was born. Angels are there explaining His ascension when He leaves. Jesus comes as a servant. He is now leaving as an exalted Savior, and it is promised that He is going to come back as a victorious King. Notice what the angels say here, though. Why do you, uh, verse 10, while they were gazing into heaven, two men stood by them in white robes. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? I think what's implied here is Jesus told you to do something. Go to Jerusalem. Don't just stand there. Go to Jerusalem. O obey what He told you to do. We are people who love the appearing of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says that there is a crown that is promised to those who love His appearing. We should long for and look for the return of Jesus, just the way that it says here that He's going to come back into the, to the earth the same way that He went into heaven. We long for His return. As a matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with us saying, is today the day? But the problem is going to be if we ever get to the point to where every day we wake up and we sit around and we say, is today the day? And we're thinking about that all the time and we're standing and gazing instead of working and serving with our eyes towards the heaven. We need more eyes on the sky while we're serving Jesus. You know, in church history, there has been incredible suffering. And those people who went through that suffering, they had an awareness of the return of Jesus that we don't have. Some of you have heard me say this before, but if you go back into the hills and the mountains of Appalachia, you know what most of their music is about? It's about heaven. Hard lives. Suffering that was unimaginable. And they sang about heaven all the time. They look forward to Jesus. We are relatively comfortable. Yes, 
there are things that come into our life. There are times of suffering. When death comes, it makes us grateful for the return of Jesus, and we look forward to it. And y'all, I know I'm only in my early 40s, but I look forward to the return of Jesus more and more every day. I hear that the older you get, that that is more and more, uh, that you're more and more aware of that, and I believe that. But it's very easy for us to be people in the comfort that we have when things are going okay to not even think about the return of Jesus. We don't need to stand and gaze, but we need to be people who remember that part of the mission is getting people ready for Him returning. Not in a scary way, but proclaiming the truth that the gospel brings reconciliation and proclaiming the truth that He brings that reconciliation by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Witnesses of the work that He has done for us. So when we walk away from this passage, what do we walk away with? We walk away with an understanding of the mission of our church. Here is why we exist. This is going to be illustrated more as we go through Acts. This is going to be fleshed out more as we go through Acts. But we gather as a church for one primary reason, to continue what Jesus started through the power and working of the Holy Spirit. And have we ever become anything other than that? We left the purpose for our existence. Someone once said that a church that isn't making disciples and isn't on mission is just a bunch of disobedient Christians hanging out. And that's not what I want to be. And I know that's not what you want to be. So let's continue to pray and ask the Lord to help us be witnesses here, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed.